Oh, well, hello there, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to some Civil War poetry. My name is Vincent Hannum, and this is my office in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here, but thanks for being here on our number 10 episode. We have, we've done nine of these. We're about to do 10. That's a milestone. Cheers to that. We got about 20 four or so more to go that's based on the book we'll get there in just a second you know what the coffee's drinkable so if you're new to the program i like to start off our day with is the coffee hot it's 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 pretty good pretty that's a damn fine cup of coffee right there I, oh man, I'm just trying to get better as a human and not slurp into the mic or at all. All right, moving on to our second feature of the day. It is this day in Civil War history. And I get these, uh, these tidbits and quotes from a source called onthisday.com. So if you are interested, uh, there you go. So in this day, in 1863, July 13th, in New York, anti-draft riots began. Order was not restored until Union soldiers returned from Gettysburg. So a couple things. That is where the uh, a large part of the soldiers who fought at Gettysburg um, went after that battle to New York to quell anti-draft riots. Uh, the Civil War was the first war with a federally mandated draft. Obviously, people weren't happy. They never are. Uh, so, yeah, hashtag fight the power. And our Civil War quote for the day is from the New York Times, which seemed fitting enough. The dead of the battlefield come up to us very rarely, even in dreams. We see the list in the morning paper at breakfast, but dismiss its recollection with the coffee. Mr. Matthew Brady has done something to bring us the terrible reality and earnestness of the war. If he has not brought bodies and laid them in our door yards and along our streets, he has done something very like it. The New York Times there is referencing Matthew Brady, who was... So first of all, photography had been around before the Civil War. However, Matthew Brady um, sort of, not revolutionized, but... I don't know how to say it, pioneered, founded. Um, like he was the first uh, f photographic journalist, if you will. He was on the battlefield ca capturing actual photographs of the dead and the wounded. And it was the first time that people reading their papers were actually confronted with these horrors um, in the realist sense that there could possibly be, uh, aside from being there. So... So that's Matthew Brady. That is photography, just one of the many innovations that the Civil War brought forth in our world. Uh, so now that we have that um, accomplished, I wanted to uh, move it on to another pro uh, feature of the program. This is before I get into the poetry, I like to read the bios of the poets themselves. Uh, and how, what we've typically done is uh, read the, the bio of the poet featured the day before i was thinking oh maybe that's like a cliffhanger come back tomorrow to see who read that poem i don't know if that worked i think we're still early uh building an audience so hey anything that works now however new week fresh fresh week fresh start um let's read the bios of the poets before i read the poem that way you can think about an added layer of the poem itself so bear with me. We are going to read four bios today. That's to catch up from Friday. So we'll do that. And on Friday, we read a poem by a friend of the program, Emily Dickinson, as well as Catherine M. Warfield. She's not a friend yet. Um, her last name is Warfield. That's all I got about her. Um so anyways, Emily Dickinson, 1830 to 1886, was born in Amherst, Massachusetts, to a prominent New England family. Though one of the great American poets, she saw only seven of her 1,775 poems published, 
all of them anonymously. It wasn't until Poems, the first collection of Dickinson's poetry published four years after the poet's death, that her work began to receive proper notice. Major figure in American literature, go do check out her stuff. We've featured a couple of her poems on this program. Um, I'd encourage you to go back in the in the um, in the archives there and read them out for yourself. The other poet we featured on Friday, her name is Catherine M. Warfield, and she was born in 1816, died in 1877. Was born Catherine Ann War Ware W A R E Catherine Ann Ware in Natchez, Mississippi. She was educated with her sister Eleanor in Philadelphia, and after marriage, settled in Kentucky. Her first books, *The Wife of Leon* and other poems (1844) and *The Indian Chamber* and other poems (1846) were written with Eleanor. She later concentrated on fiction, writing ten romances during the last seventeen years of her life. Okay, that's interesting. So, what's interesting about that is um, Warfield come. She contributed to the Confederate poem on Friday. And it seems like she has a law rather, you know, a uh, substantial amount of work there liter literature wise. So I just like to maybe do a little research on her. If you happen to know a little bit more about her, do share. I'd be interested in knowing why I don't know more about her. Maybe all of her stuff was super racist. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Uh, so today's featured poems are from a fellow named Herman Melville, know him, love him, read his stuff, and Margaret Junkin Preston. Melville obviously represents the Union side and Margaret Junkin Preston, the Confederate. And again, my little spiel each morning is about this book, Poetry of the Civil War. This is where I'm drawing my poems. It is divided into two sections, one the blue, one the gray. Um... And I, I will read one poem from each side, compare and contrast, um, see how people at the time were feeling about this conflict. A lot of these poems are from the war years itself, 1861 and 65. A few have been before and a few have been a couple decades after, uh, which has been really interesting to see how people are now looking back with some sort of nostalgia. Uh, so with that in mind, I will dive into Mr. Melville's poem, it is titled Malvern Hill, July 1862. Ye elms that wave on Malvern Hill in prime of morn and May, recall ye how McClellan's men here stood at bay? While deep within your forest dim our rigid comrades lay, some with the cartridge in their mouth, others with fixed arms lifted south, Invoking so the cypress glades, ah, wilds of woe. The spires of Richmond, late beheld through rifts in musket haze, were closed from view in clouds of dust on leaf-walled ways. Where streamed our wagons in caravan, and the seven nights and days of march and fast retreat and fight pinched our grimed faces to ghastly plight. Does the elm wood recall the haggard beards of blood? The battle smoked flag with stars eclipsed. We followed it. It never fell. In silence, husbanded our strength, received their yell. Till on this slope, we patient turned with cannon ordered well. Reverse, we proved, was not defeat. But ah, the sod, what thousands meet. Does Malvern Hill bethink itself and muse and brood? We elms of Malvern Hill remember everything. But sap the twig will fall. Wag the world how it will. Leaves must be green in spring. Good old Herman Melville. So, yeah. Um, first of all, I love that last line. Um, leaves must be green in spring. And the elms are watching this battle. I don't know Malvern Hill specifically, but those elms sure do. And they're watching all this soldiers fall. And we elms of Malvern Hill remember everything. Leaves must be green in spring. That's nice. 
it's nice, but hauntingly so. So um, our our second poem of the day is The Gray. It is a, a, uh, a poem from a Confederate sympathizer, at the very least. And it is called The Boo bivouac in the snow uh the bivouac in the snow again is by margaret junkin preston this poem is uh down in the description if you'd like to follow along halt the march is over day is almost done loose the cumbrous knapsack drop the heavy gun chilled and wet and weary wander to and fro Seeking wood to kindle fires amidst the snow. Round the bright blaze gather, heed not sleet or cold. Ye are Spartan soldiers, stout and brave and bold. Never Xerxian army yet subdued a foe, Who but asked a blanket on a bed of snow. Shivering midst the darkness, Christian men are found, They're devoutly kneeling on the frozen ground pleading for their country in its hour of woe, for the soldiers marching shoeless through the snow. Lost in heavy slumbers, free from toil and strife, dreaming of their dear ones, home and child and wife. Tentless they are lying, while the fires burn low, lying in their blankets midst December's snow. That is called the bivouac in the snow. If you don't know, a bivouac is a is an outdoor sleeping encampment. I had to look that up myself. Um, and what's not very often featured with the Confederate poems is a sense of longing and somewhat despair. They've tended to be a little bit more raw, raw. Um, but Biz Preston has. Uh, I think accurately conveyed the yeah the disparity of a, what a soldier's life can be. Um, the, in this case, these guys are in the snow without shelter. So that is poetry of the Civil War for uh, Monday, July thirteenth. We're back, baby! So like, comment, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff, and we'll see you tomorrow live at seven thirty. Eh, or you can check out um, check out the, the video a little later on in the afternoon. Either way, I really appreciate being here, and so long.